sites where they will put the shirt up for like a brewery in Georgia, but it'll be on this Briss site and they'll sell the shirt. Kids that are essentially starving in Kenya that that we've had a request for, but I'm not sure where that's at, and we'll see where that goes. And we had a new request from a fellow named Ajay in the, the Canadian side of Rotary District 5050. He was wanting some money, and I can't even remember what it was for, but. Um, we're pursuing that with him. And so we have plenty of places to spend money to a good cause. And it is really important that we raise enough money this year to, if we're going to support those efforts. And I had a question is the money that we're giving to the foundation, that's just going to be going to the Cedar Woolley Rotary Foundation. Is that correct? Not the Rotary International Foundation unless we designate it. So, and if that's the case, you wouldn't get Paul Harris credits for this extra money unless you send it to RI. Am I correct on that? Uh, that's correct, Carl. Uh, and a uh, $1,000 uh, to uh, Rotary International uh, gets a uh, Paul Harris award, which is the uh, way other clubs do it. We've done it more on merit before. But uh, certainly, if you want to give to uh, the International Foundation, and uh, I forgot to mention that uh, when we uh, talked about donations with the dues, that uh, we'd love to encourage everyone, if they can, to uh, designate a hundred dollars to Rotary International, and the other money, like my auction money, I would give. I'm giving to the uh, Cedro Woolley Rotary Foundation. So there are two distinct, different areas there. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and there's another way to give, and that's through the district. And I think if you give the district, if you give to the district, they match dollar for dollar. So if you gave $500, for example, I think you get a Paul Harris out of that, which a Paul Harris credit for those new people here. $1,000 donated to the Rotary Foundation gets you a Paul Harris Fellow Award, and uh, you can have more than one if, if you buy. You can buy as many as you want, and it's all good. Okay. Hey, Danielle, I'm putting you on the spot, but uh, what what's going on with your swing? So, do you can you give us an update at all, or if if Rotary needs to help there, or, or what's going on? No, we're just trying to track down some of the contractors with materials. Uh, we're ready. The swing's ready. We have all the funds we need to finish the job. Uh, so we're working with Nathan at the city. Um, but the surfacing material, they've gone missing. The, the contractor since COVID started. So um, trying to see if they're still in business or where they're at. Okay, um, there's, and I don't know exactly how to do this, but maybe Stephanie and you could talk because there's a Patrick Dillon that is helping us with ours who has access to all those different places that have that kind of, uh, um, uh, material so maybe there's a, a different way we can go at it there okay perfect all right and then the last one i wanted to talk to and and jeff doesn't know it but jeff give us a a, a rundown of the scholarship stuff <clears throat> all right well the letters went out um i gave we gave scholarships to uh i think 13 Cirilli kids uh, there's one concrete kid that I did not get his letter out because I need to get a, contact the the uh, school up there and get his address so I can send him the letter. I, 
I'm sure somewhere in the pile of stuff that has built up over the last uh, number of weeks, I have his address, but it's like a, I uh, misplaced the, uh, the, his address at somewhere along the line. So I just need to get that information, but yeah, the, uh, the letters went out. Um, we gave scholarships to, of $3,000 to uh, the, most people, I think three got three or four got $2,500 just to make it work. And that was based on when it came down to it, the, of the people that I had, I just looked and saw, well, the people that whose parents were able to contribute a little bit more. Uh, that's how I kind of decided how we were, how to give the $500 less to, to so those people just based on need. It seemed like the easiest way to kind of, figure that out but yeah I think everything seems to be have gone well and um, they will be payable on the uh, in January term so and then um, normally the uh, the scholarships uh, expire in July of the following year so like these scholarships would expire in July of 2021 but uh, I took a little executive privilege and, and extended that expiration date to January of 2022, just uh, so that way they're, they have a whole year from the time the scholarship payment is, is available that way. If some, for some reason, um, you know, somebody's life gets put on hold for a while, they have a little extra time to, to get back into school. And as always there, there's always the opportunity that they could, if they don't use their scholarship, they could come back to us and say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm taking a year off because you know whatever happened, and they, that would the board could decide if they want to extend that. Well, Jeff, I'm glad you took that prerogative because if you would have brought it to the board, we would have said absolutely yes in this case. So um, that's the beauty of Rotary is, is that we got all these leaders, and uh, we don't have very many followers, and it works well that way. Uh, so we just have to agree with the leaders that we have when they do something that that was the right thing to do. So great, great job. So any other business uh, that we should bring up before we uh, do our, uh, our program for today? Mike, were you going to have Tim or Danny or someone speak about uh, the last rotary auction and if any decisions were made or... Danny's shaking her head, so maybe not Danny. Tim, maybe? I don't know if anything was decided, but it's still up on our Facebook page as though we're having it, so I'm just kind of waiting for official words so I can put out that it's actually canceled, sort of, in person at least. So the Rotary auction is canceled. We discussed an, in, an online auction uh, that would be the last week of July. It's not finalized. Uh, we did agree to pay, I think it's like $800 or something to whatever our auction group, the auction, whoever runs our, our normal auction to help us with an online one. There's a lot of details that need to be uh, ironed out. Um, and like the total number of items, uh, how it works. We don't know any of that stuff yet. So. Um, but it's going to be like the last week of July, maybe silent or whatever you would call it for a couple of days. And then um, the last hour, all the items would, all the live items come on basically at the same time, they do a little video uh, thing. So Daryl or someone will have to figure that out, but we're gonna have a little video clip of the item. We're gonna have a video clip of what projects we're doing and then they all you can just bid until um the we say we're done and i'm not sure exactly how that works i have never been on one but that's kind of the story that we're going to go and uh the goal is to raise like one hundred twenty thousand dollars with the uh with everything and uh mike uh Mosher, you were kind of in it. Do you want to add or subtract to that? Yeah, no, you uh, you pretty much hit it right on. I mean, there, there's also going to be kind of a fun and item thing for, for, you know, for instance, Patrick's Playground, scholarships, uh, dictionaries, things like that, uh, or even community projects where we're just asking people to donate money without bidding on anything. And my feeling is we'll probably get more money that way than trying to sell a bunch of uh, – 
silent auction items. It, the number of silent auction items will be very limited. Uh, the live auctions, like you said, will be 10 to 15 live auction items. Uh, Stokes Auction House has ran lots of these things and they, they will be helping us out. But Tim is in the process of evaluating, talking to Stokes right now, and we'll be calling another meeting, I'm guessing within the next week or so. So that's where we're at. Hey, Mike. This is, this is Tim. And yeah, we are planning for that end of July auction. And I have talked to Stokes. Uh, th things are changing a little bit there. They actually, to put on the whole show, which will be on $4,500. So we're going to have to consider whether we want to go that route or try to get another approach to it. So at this point, Danny and I are working, uh, looking at the previous auctions that have been run and trying to figure out what would be the best course of action for us. And we'll be ready to go. We have a meeting next Monday and start to figure things out. So I'll try to let everybody know by, uh, by next week, actually. Okay, we're okay. good. Go ahead, Mike. I've got nothing else. Carl, did you have something you needed to say? Carl, you gotta unmute yourself. Thanks, sorry. I was just gonna say the Fidalgo Rotary Club and the, I got an invitation to that as well as the Boys and Girls Club uh, auctions. I wanna chime into those and just do a little bit of uh, spying for lack of a better word, just to figure out what they're doing, how they're doing it. And the people in the planning, uh, anybody that does join in on these other auctions, make sure and give feedback to Tim so that uh, we we are as best prepared as we can be. And I have a, I did I did what you guys were suggesting. I I went to uh, get lunch yesterday, and uh, so Yulia doesn't know this, but she bought a fifty dollar gift certificate to uh, Lorenzo's that will be donated to the auction. Ready to go, Yulia? <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we need to do is uh, figure out where to send Tim so that he gets better internet than where he's at. Because uh, <laughs> um, out of all of, all of these, I mean, that's why I'm at my office because mine doesn't work at my house at all. So, um, so we'll go from there. Anything else we want to bring up? Okay, uh, with, without anything else, we are going to now turn this over to our uh, program director of great quality, and uh, we'll go from there. So, Shein. I'm really, really excited to introduce Joanne to you. Um, I asked her what, she, what I might you know, say, but she told me something really boring, which is, I mean, not boring, but um, I know her. She's a friend of mine. She's from Cedar Woolley. They, um, her and her husband are both veterans. So she, um, she wouldn't say this, but she's got a great set of pipes and a good set of guns, and she's, she knows how to manage those too. Um, so right now, she is the executive director of Dementia, Dementia Support Northwest, and that's what she's going to talk um, to us about right now. But um, She's, she's a pretty awesome gal. So she disappeared. So I'm hoping she's hiding back. Oh, there she is. So Joanne, um, tell us what you want to say. We're, we're excited. Hey, well, thank you for having me. Um, I was telling Sheena earlier, it's been quite a while since I have done the speaking. I've been hosting a lot of things on, on our organization's behalf, but it's been like me, like introducing people and that's it. So I feel a little rusty. So thank you for this. Um, and I just want to start with um, the full understanding that this is dementia is not the top of everybody's list of fun things to talk about. So I appreciate that you guys came knowing that this was going to be <laughs> mentioned. Um, but we're all aging and no one's going backwards in time. So this is something that it's going to affect us all at some point, whether directly or indirectly. And some of you might be caring for people right now that have this going on, um, or maybe you're starting to notice some things either in yourself or somebody else. 
So I just want to kind of give an overview of what we do and just a few things that I think would be beneficial to just start the conversation. Um, I could talk about it all day, so I'm trying to hit the high points. So uh, Dementia Support Northwest is a registered nonprofit. We are located up in Bellingham, but we serve Skagit and Whatcom and really anybody. Um, we get phone calls from people from all over the place, um, whether they have family here or they've got family somewhere else. So really what we do is we support those that are affected by dementia. And what that means is either the person experiencing the symptoms, the caregivers, the neighbors, the professionals that work with them. So we're here to supply resources, education, hands-on training. And we're also here to hold your hand right now. That has to happen in the virtual sense um, and kind of walk you through this because it's hard and nobody should have to do it alone. Uh, our mantra is you are not alone and we wanna help as much as we can. And if we can't do it, we'll find somebody who can help you. So uh, I'll start with, we don't have all the answers. And if anybody says they do, run the opposite direction because there are no concrete fixes for this. Um, and it's really easy to get caught up in your situation and think it's hopeless and that you just have to kind of put your head down and get through it. But there actually are so many things that can be done to make the process easier. So the main thing to know is dementia is an umbrella term and it describes a wide range of symptoms, including memory loss and mental decline. Uh, dementia related illnesses cause the skill set of an individual to diminish. So basically the brain is failing. And that's a very blunt way to say it. But I think once people can kind of understand that and wrap their head around it, that's really when the learning and, um, you know, the aim for hope comes in. So trying to use logic and reason is definitely part of the human makeup. Uh, however, the logic side of the brain is almost always affected first on that left side. Um, the right side is where the rhythm is. That's usually the last preserved, which is why music is so powerful for people that have a dementia-related illness. So telling your mother that family dinner is Saturday, not Sunday, we've already talked about this, is not helpful because short-term memory is also one of the very first things that starts slipping away. So she might not remember that you had that conversation. Um, also, taking the tactic of you can't drive because you could hurt somebody, you know, really trying to reason with them, it's probably not going to make sense because that logic side of the brain is failing. And they might have forgotten in that moment that they can't drive because they're living in the long-term memory of five years ago when they could. So I tell people all the time, um, if you're a family care partner especially, you need to learn a whole new language now. So the person that you've been married to for 60 years or that raised you or that grew up uh, with you is slowly starting to change. And that's something that nobody has any control over. And that's a really hard thing to first of all acknowledge and second of all to cope with and third of all to navigate through. It's a loss, it's a grieving process. And it's something that nobody should be doing alone. It can happen and go on for many years. So family caregivers, like those of you that are at home caring for a person, both physically and emotionally, that's a lot of work. And it's a progressive disease. There's currently no cure, but there's still a lot of hope and a lot that you can do. Uh, it's important to realize that um, it's not something people can just snap out of because it's irritating to us. And there's ways that we can respond and approach that will help. So again, when our brain is functioning at full capacity and we're sitting next to somebody whose brain function is diminishing, who has the power to adjust? And sometimes that can be a really hard thing to want to give into, but that's what it is. So memory is not the only thing that changes with dementia and that's a really important thing to understand. Um, what we know is that dementia happens when two or more parts of the brain are failing. There's over 90 different kinds of dementia. So people think that Alzheimer's is the only kind of dementia and it's the most commonly known. But again, there's over 90 different kinds. So there, these dementia related illnesses are caused by many different things. They affect different things. So how you respond to that is going to be different. Uh, so for example, frontotemporal dementia, um, can lead to aggressiveness and uh, a lack of impulse control. So somebody who had never heard a fly all of a sudden might be violent and you're going to respond differently than somebody who's just experiencing short-term memory issues 
like somebody who has Alzheimer's disease. So it's not one size fits all. The different types look different on everybody. So just because somebody or everybody in your family has it do, does not mean that you're going to get it. And if you do get it, it's not gonna be the same way necessarily. So it's not just memory, it affects motor skills, verbal skills, ability to recognize when we have an infection. Um, so if the brain is not fitting with the rest of the body, we're not going to know that we have an infection and that can be a very big problem. Um, so the important thing is really addressing it. A lot of people like to wait until they absolutely have to look for help and going at it proactively is much easier to deal with it. Not saying that conversation is going to be any easier the sooner or later you do it, um, but it definitely helps. So doing things, and I'll put a slide up for you afterwards with some checklists that you can do, um, but you know, talking to an elder lawyer, uh, figuring out if you can actually use Medicaid. Are you doing what you need to be doing um, right now? For example, five years before you turn 65, you cannot be giving out any major gifts. And I'm sure a lot of you know that, but there's a lot of Medicaid things that we don't think about until it's something that could be an issue. So questions I, I often get is why would I want to know if I have dementia? You know, this is, I, I don't want to talk about it. I'm just going to deal with it. You know, my father for once is take me out to the woods and leave me alone. And it's an individualized thing. Um, but it doesn't just affect the individual. This affects, you know, it's micro, macro, meso, it, all of the different people that are um, involved. So for example, I think it only affects me. I'm not going to be told that I can't drive because I'm fine. But Susie runs out in front of me in the street. And now in that moment, my brain's not communicating quickly enough with my foot to hit that brake pedal. So it is an issue that affects everybody. Um, and I know that driving is one of the most complicated things to talk to people about. And we definitely have strategies. That's one of the most common things we troubleshoot with people. So um, how else can we help as an organization? So it's very necessary to understand what's going on and what that person is not capable of anymore and what they are losing. But I really want to just focus on that for like a second, just because that's the responsible thing to do, and then start focusing on what they still can do. Because life does not stop the minute you get a diagnosis of anything. There's still so much qualitative life that can happen. Um, you just need the education and the support. So we have caregiver support groups. So that's for like family caregivers, neighbors, anybody that's just looking for information. They're educational based. Uh, we also have groups for those with uh, a diagnosis. And these groups for both are very important because depression goes hand in hand with this and they help combat that social isolation. So we also do memory screenings. Um, we have head talks, which are health education about dementia. So they dive into specific topics that people want more information about. And we also help um, hook people up with, uh, we have Project Lifesaver in Whatcom County in Skagit. It's called Life, or it's called Care Track. And it's a wandering uh, bracelet or a locating bracelet. So people with a kind of dementia related illness don't wander until they do. And that can be a very scary thing and it's not always a great outcome. Uh, so these bracelets I can't advocate for enough. There's a lot of different GPS things out there that people can utilize. Um, but these specific bracelets are radio, radio wave frequency. So um, when you don't have service, they still work. And the, the rescue time is cut in half. So um, they're linked to the sheriff's department and I can get you more information on that. Um, but really just trying to figure out what your life would look like if you had this to think ahead, you know, do you have your power of attorney? Um, is that power of attorney somebody that you actually trust to make those decisions? Because my husband and I have very different opinions about what things would look like. So I don't necessarily want him in charge of uh, following through with things because he might not follow through with what I want. And then having backups because, um, 40% of the time, the family caregivers will actually succumb to injury or death before their person living with the disease because of the stress. And that's a very big deal. So if your power of attorney is your wife and your wife has a heart attack, and now 
your four kids all have to agree on the same thing, that could be a problem. So, um, you know, we're just here to support people and I do a lot of workshops and trainings and I wish people would come to me before they're in a crisis, but we do a lot of crisis management for people. So um, we're here and I'm going to share a slide that has just a little, little tiny to-do list and ways to contact me um, just in case anyone is in need of that. So that is basically what I have. Um, yes. So, so if you uh, wave, maybe uh, Travis or somebody can, um, uh, you know, unmute you and if you have a question. I have a question, Jen. Um, did so before COVID, you did a lot more hands-on interaction with like families and seniors. Um, what was it like then versus now? So we have to do all of our groups virtually, um, which can be difficult. Um, you know, we actually were literally doing a lot of hand holding and um, having people come to us and sit in our office and, you know, having that aha moment that this is what was happening to them and, and helping them work through that. It's, it's obviously much better to be physically with somebody for that support. Um, the screen does create a little bit of a barrier. Um, and now we're seeing people have new challenges where they're either quarantined with their loved one and they used our classes as like a two hour break you know, um, or they can't get in to see their loved one. And, and that's hard. Um, and, and, you know, with the less activity, there is some, some more um, decline with people that are home. So we're trying to come up with newer ways to get people engaged. And, you know, it's a, a new way of doing things currently. So it, it is different. And obviously, you know, our physical fundraisers got affected as well. So, so that's something we're trying to figure out. I have a question, Joanne. Um, maybe you've already answered this. And I apologize if you have earlier in your initial um, introduction. You talked about some of the questions that um, people with dementia ask and what is the proper way to respond um, to questions such as, as an example, my mother-in-law came to live with us 10 years ago when her husband passed away and every night she would ask us where he was. That was that was very difficult to, and we were doing the same thing you said. We just responded the same way every time, but it, every time that brought up those memories of, of that. Right, so that that's a big one. Um, what happens is because that short-term memory is gone, um, that person is actually experiencing that information, that news like it's the very first time. So they're being flooded with that grief over and over again every time. So um, there's different schools of thoughts on it. What, what we use is, um, you know, thinking out of the box, creative deceptiveness is a term that a lot of people use where, um, you know, dignity is very important. And if it's not affecting their safety, that's what we wanna try to keep for them. So, um, a really great way is diverting. You know, there comes a, a point in their progression where they don't need to know everything. It's going to cause more harm. So by trying to divert and say, you know what, remember the time that you guys did that and try to get them to just kind of talk about something happy. Um, and if it keeps coming up, you have to find the comfort level that you have, but saying, you know what, he's, he must be at the store because putting them through that over and over again is probably causing more strife for everybody. Yeah, I agree. That that's that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Okay. Well, I have a couple uh, points on dementia. I have a uh, um, my wife's uh, uncle is uh, down at uh, the memory care place here in Cedar Woolley. Um, and by the way, they do an outstanding job. Uh, and uh, um, so I recommend that they do a great job. I haven't been able to see them in like a couple months because they're not allowing anybody in there. Um, but, and you're absolutely right. He's down there, he sings to every woman in the place. Uh, 
but he doesn't know how to tie his shoes. So um, different parts of his brain. And a doctor once told me, he says, the difference between dementia and just getting old, um, because we all get forgetful and I was, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to know that the, the rule he said is, is that if you're getting old, you can't remember where you put your keys. But if you have dementia, the keys are in your hand and you don't know what they're for. And I thought that that was a pretty good uh, analysis of what these guys are going through. And the other thing is, I just always agreed with them. Uh, whatever they want, you know, they want ice cream at one or, you know, whatever time it is, you just get them ice cream because somewhere in their mind, that's what they wanted. And, um, but you really have to be careful when they're in the car because you'll just stop at a stop sign and they've never done this in their life. They'll just get out and take off running. So those are the kind of things you have to be careful of. But uh, thank you very much, Joanne, for coming. And unless there's something else, uh, I think we're going to wrap up. So any other uh, um, questions for Joanne? Thank you for having me, Mike. I appreciate the platform. Oh, good, good. And um, so unless there's something else for this meeting, um, I thought this was a very, a very good meeting. We, uh, um, to me, it's getting harder and harder to do Zoom meetings because um, I just want to be with all you guys in the worst way. And uh, I'm not a social uh, corner person. I'm a social in the everyone's face person. And so, um, but I really appreciate the time and effort to, that the rest of the Rotarians are putting in and it keeps me moving. And I really appreciate all of you guys as Rotarians and especially as friends. So unless there's something else, I still don't have a bell. Um, we are adjourned. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Thanks, okay. Mike. Thank you, you guys. Thanks, Mike. See you later. Yeah. Tomorrow, next week. Bye, David. Bye, everybody.